Good morning. Good morning. My name is Kevin Baumiller, and I am very, very privileged to be Reading's Veteran Services Officer. Welcome to our honored guests, Town Manager Fidel Maltez, Captain Brendan Gray, Reading Select Board Member Jackie McCarthy, Father Stephen Rock, Representative Brad Jones, Senator Jason Lewis, and all our cer ceremony participants, and especially all of you. What a beautiful day to celebrate, honor, and most of all, remember all those that have served to protect our freedoms and have gone before us. It's been three long years since we've been here in Laurel Hill on Memorial Day. Thank you for spending your morning with us. At this time, I ask you all to stand, if you are able, for the invocation by Reverend Stephen Rock, St. Agnes, and St. Athanasius Parishes. Captain, United States Navy, retired. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we live in a world today that is adrift with frustration, anger, and violence that has even invaded our schools. We ask you to have mercy on your people and open our hearts to your peace and to your way of love. As we pause today to remember all those who have given the ultimate sacrifice, protecting our freedoms, I would like to quote a Jewish chaplain at the burial of Marines, the end of the Battle of Iwo Jima. And I quote, we dedicate ourselves first to live together in peace, the way they fought and are buried in war. Here are the officers and men, blacks and whites, rich and poor, together. Here are Protestants, Catholics, and Jews, together. Here no man prefers another because of his faith or despise him because of his color. Among these men, there's no discrimination, no prejudices, no hatred. Theirs is the highest and purest democracy. Too much blood has gone into the soil for us to let it lie barren. Too much pain and heartache has fertilized the earth on which we stand. Here we solemnly swear, this shall not be in vain, out of this. And from the suffering and sorrow of those who mourn this will come, we promise, a birth of a new freedom for all humanity everywhere. And let us say, amen, amen. Thank you, Father Rock. The Reading Police Department will now present the colors, and the national anthem will be performed by the Reading Memorial High School Band.
Please be seated if you're able. I now welcome Sean Murphy, a life scout from Reading Troop 702. He will present the Governor's Memorial Day Proclamation. A proclamation. Whereas, while the nation was still recovering from the horrors of the Civil War, people in cities and towns across the country gathered to honor those Union and Confederate soldiers who had given their lives celebrating the first Decoration Day. And, whereas, after World War I, the nation came together again to honor those who had fallen in the service of their country. Renamed Memorial Day, the last Monday in May, is when people remember and honor the memory of all the men and women who fought and died in all American wars and conflicts. And whereas, throughout the country's history, thousands of Massachusetts citizens have fought in wars and conflicts to defend our safety and way of life. And whereas, their legacy of patriotism and dedication to country is an inspiration to all Americans. And whereas, it is appropriate that all Massachusetts citizens remember the bravery of those who gave their lives so that their sacrifices serve as a reminder of the cost of our freedom. Now, therefore, I, Charles D. Baker, Governor of the Ma Commonwealth of Massachusetts, do hereby proclaim May 30th, 2022 to be Memorial Day and urge all citizens of the Commonwealth to take cognizance of this event and participate fittingly in, a, in its observance. Given at the Executive Chamber in Boston this first day of May in the year 2022 and of the independence of the United States of America, the 245th, by His Excellency, Charles D. Baker, Governor of the Commonwealth, Karen E. Polito, Lieutenant Governor of the Commonwealth, and William Francis Galvin, Secretary of the Commonwealth. God save the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Thanks very much, Sean. 154 years ago, retired Union General John Logan organized the first National Decoration Day to honor the fallen after the Civil War. This has become our Memorial Day. I'd now like to invite Timothy Duggan, Reading Memorial High School Junior, to read General Logan's Memorial Day General Orders. The 30th day of May, 1868, is designated for the purpose of strewing with flowers, or otherwise decorating the graves of comrades who died in defense of their country during the late rebellion, and whose bodies now lie in almost every city, village, and hamlet churchyard in the land. Thank you. In this observance, no form of ceremony is prescribed, but posts and comrades will, in their own way, arrange such fitting services and testimonials of respect as circumstances may permit. We are organized comrades, as our regulations tell us, for the purpose, among other things, of preserving and strengthening those kind and fraternal feelings which have bound together the soldiers, sailors, and Marines who united to suppress the late rebellion. What can aid more to assure this result than cherishing tenderly the memory of our heroic dead who made their breasts a barricade between our country and its foes? Their soldier lives were the reveille of freedom to a race in chains, and their deaths the tattoo of rebellious tyranny in arms. We should guard their graves with sacred vigilance. All that the consecrated wealth and taste of the nation can add to their adornment and security is but a fitting tribute to the memory of her slain defenders. Let no wanton foot tread rudely on such hallowed grounds. Let pleasant paths invite the coming and going of reverent visitors and fond mourners. Let no vandalism of avarice or neglect, no ravages of time, testify to the present or to the coming generations that we have forgotten as a people the cost of a free and undivided republic. If our eyes grow dull, other hands slack, and other hearts cold in the solemn trust, ours shall keep it well as long as the light and warmth of life remain to us. Let us then, at the time appointed, gather around their sacred remains and garland the passionless mounds above them with the choicest flowers of springtime. Let us raise above them the dear old flag they saved from his honor. Let us, in this solemn presence, renew our pledges to aid and assist those whom they have left among us a sacred charge upon a nation's gratitude the soldiers and sailors, widow and orphan. It is the purpose of the commander in chief to inaugurate this observance with the hope that it will be kept up from year to year while a survivor of the war remains to honor the memory of his departed comrades. He earnestly desires the public press to lend its friendly aid in bringing to the notice of comrades in all parts of the country 
in time for simultaneous compliance therewith. Department commanders will use efforts to make this order effective. Thank you, Timothy. The high school band will now perform America the Beautiful. Thank you, very well done. I now welcome our town manager, Fidel Maltez, to share a Memorial Day welcome. Good morning. My name is Fidel Maltez, and I am, and I am Reading's new town manager. On behalf of the town of Reading, it is my honor and privilege to humbly welcome you to our Memorial Day celebration. Today's celebration is particularly special because it is for the first time due to our global COVID pandemic that we can fully gather to honor our fallen soldiers. Memorial Day began on May 30th, 1868, and it was originally called Decoration Day. It was a day to honor those fallen during a bloody and divisive civil war. It was meant as a day of national reconciliation to bring us all together, to unite us, so that we could honor those who made the ultimate sacrifice for our country. Today, I cannot think of a better message for all of our society and our town. Let us all celebrate this Memorial Day with unity. Let us all celebrate the fallen heroes, and let us all support their families who carry the heavy burden of loss. Finally, I want to express my deep gratitude to our veterans, our Boy Scouts, our Town of Reading staff, and the volunteers who have spent countless hours making this day special. Thank you. Thank you, Fidel. From the State House, I now welcome Senator Jason Lewis for Memorial Day greetings. Thank you, Kevin. Good morning, everybody. It's truly an honor to join with you today to pay tribute to our nation's fallen, fallen heroes. And thank you very much for being with us today. Over the years, we have commemorated the sacrifices of our fallen service members and their Gold Star families on Memorial Day through good times and hard times. These last few years during a global pandemic have been especially difficult for many of us none more so than our elderly veterans who have faced such significant health risks and social isolation. But even in the midst of this very challenging time in our nation's history, we recognize how much we have to be thankful for. We recognize that the freedom and the opportunity that we enjoy is not shared by millions, tens of millions, of less fortunate people around the world who live under despotic rulers who do not respect human rights. And we recognize that our freedom and our opportunity comes from the struggle and the great sacrifices made by previous generations. President Woodrow Wilson said of the American flag, the, the lines of red are lines of blood nobly and unselfishly shed by men who love the liberty of their fellow men more than they love their own lives and fortunes. Today, on Memorial Day, we offer our deepest gratitude 
to those who have made the ultimate sacrifice for our country, to their family members and loved ones, and to all those men and women who have served in our armed forces, including those serving right now all around the world. It is thanks to them that we can all sleep peacefully tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jason. We are also very fortunate today to have Rep Representative Bradley Jones join us. Brad. Thank you, Kevin. Good morning. I'm honored to join you this morning as we pause to pay tribute to our nation's fallen heroes. We all know that freedom is never free, but rather is a precious commodity that has been paid for a thousand times over by our servicemen and women, as well as their families. Today, we come together to remember and to honor the many individuals who have answered the call to serve in America's military and who gave their last full measure of devotion in service to our nation. I'm constantly reminded of just how much we ask of our veterans and their families. Seven years ago, I had the privilege of meeting Arthur Vars from Reading, whose family knows well the many sacrifices made by our nation's veterans. His uncle, U.S. Army Sergeant Christopher Young Vars was a member of the greatest generation, serving in World War II and later in Korea. Sergeant Vars was officially declared as missing in action on November 29, 1950, after his unit was overrun by Chinese forces near the Chosin Reservoir in North Korea. For 65 years, the Vars family never had a sense of closure as Sergeant Vars remained missing in action. Although he was initially thought to have been killed in battle, Sergeant Fires was actually captured and held as a prisoner of war where he died in captivity. Arthur and his siblings made a promise to their father before he died that they would never forget and would do everything they could someday to bring their uncle home. Through all the years of uncertainty, the Vars family never gave up hope. Finally, in 2015, Sergeant Vars' remains were identified through DNA testing and returned to his family for a proper burial at Woodlawn Cemetery in Everett. In 2019, just days before Memorial Day, Arthur Vars proudly accepted the Medal of Liberty on behalf of his uncle at a statehouse ceremony. The Medal of Liberty is a state-issued military honor that was created in 2009. It's presented annually to the next of kin of Massachusetts service members who were killed in action, died in service while in a designated combat area in the line of duty, died as a result of wounds received in action, or died as a result of a training accident in the line of duty. The medal serves as a visible reminder of the many sacrifices made by our veterans. When, on, when Arthur was honored in 2019, more than 500 medals had already been issued, but it is estimated that as many as 8,500 other families might be eligible for the medal. It wasn't long after that day that Arthur approached me with the idea of final legislation to create a special Medal of Liberty license plate to honor our state's fallen service members, something I was more than happy to do. Last Monday, one week ago today, nearly three years of advocacy on behalf of our veterans came to fruition when the Registry of Motor Vehicles unveiled the new, liberal, new Medal of Liberty license plate. The license plate, like the Medal of Liberty itself, is a visible reminder of the ultimate offering so many of our servicemen and women have made at the altar of freedom to preserve, protect, and defend our nation. Visible reminders commend us as a community, a commonwealth, and a country to remember the sacrifices made by those we honor today remind us that we must never forget their service and their sacrifice to our country. As Americans, we have a duty and an obligation to remember, remember the many men and women who have made the ultimate sacrifice to defend our democracy and to preserve the many freedoms we continue to enjoy. We can never forget our fallen veterans, and we must always strive to honor them not only on Memorial Day, but each and every day, and visible reminders commend us to do so. Thank you, and God bless the United States of America and all our fallen heroes. Thanks very much, Brad. Senator Jason Lewis and Representative Brad Jones, you've been true supporters of all veterans' issues. Thank you for all you do. I'd now like to introduce Jackie McCarthy, Reading Select Board member, for a, mem for a Memorial Day address.
Thank you, Kevin, for your service. Thank you, town staff, to our state house delegation, to all the volunteers who made this beautiful, special day possible. How fortunate we are to be in this space together, to take a moment to reflect on ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, aunts, and uncles. It's awe-inspiring to think of their courage, their bravery, their sacrifice for the ideal of America, for their camaraderie with their fellow soldiers, airmen, seamen. Let's take a moment to hold space for their families whose loss, whose pain, whose grief is beyond words. I first understood this in my own family. Right around this time every year, the McCarthy's who never lack <laughs> for words, for never lack for something to say, always close their grocery store in suburban New York on May 24th to commemorate the loss of my Uncle Jackie, killed in Vietnam on May 24th, 1969, less than one month after his 20th birthday. Even before I was old enough to even begin to understand that service, that sacrifice, even before I could grasp the depths of pain and loss that my family felt, I knew by the silence that befell our family on that day every year that this was something truly awe-inspiring, that this was something really extraordinary. And so every year, this time of year, this beautiful time of year, I remember my Uncle Jackie, who I never got to meet. I wonder what he would think of our world today, 53 years later now. And I think about how we should express our gratitude, not only with these words, not only with lifting up our fallen service members and their families in our prayers and in our reflections, but most importantly, how we can do them honor, some measure of honor for their sacrifice in our actions, in our temperament, in how we treat each other, especially those who th maybe think differently than we do or have different backgrounds than we have. Those are the kinds of ideals that represent the best of us and how fortunate we are to have a measure of the ultimate sacrifice for these ideals from those we honor today. So thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Jill Mayberry, United States Air Force veteran, will now read the Roll Call of Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. These are the veterans that have passed since last Memorial Day, 2021. David Barrett, Robert Barrett, John Barrett, Jr., Anthony Peter Belcamino, William Black, Bertha Kale, Carmine Camarato Jr., Joseph Collins Jr., Robert Crosby, Richard Curran, Jason Demers, William Denhard, John Doucette, Leonard Ebert, Charles L. Thomas Flanagan, William Grace, Edgar Havey, William Hayes, Lewis Higgins, Arthur Hubbard, William Hunfield, Thomas Hunt, Robert Herford, John Jenks, James Kaiser, Fred Lamson, Robert Larson, Philip LeBlanc, Gitano Locante, William Lorden, Eugene Lubier, 
Walter Mack, Lawrence McHugh, Thomas McKenna, John Metropolis, Donald Monson, Thomas Murray, Richard Nolan, John O'Malley, Richard Parsons, Robert Parsons, Alfred Perry, Salvatore Picciuto, Donald Port, David Powers, Jean Rossi, John Santolicito, John Shanahan, William Stasiowski, Donald Thompson, William Webster Jr., Arthur Paul White, Bruce Woodbury. May they rest in peace. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. We will now place a wreath in honor of all our fallen heroes. I'm now honored to welcome Brendan Gray, Captain, United States Navy, retired. Brendan was born in Dublin, Ireland, and immigrated to the United States with, United States with his parents. He grew up in Boston and received his commission from the U.S. Naval Academy in 1977. A naval aviator, he flew the P-3 Orion as well as other Navy aircraft and deployed extensively in the Pacific and Indian Oceans. He commanded Patrol Squadron 9 in Barbers Point, Hawaii, deploying to the Western Pacific, Western Pacific and Indian Oceans. Captain Gray was assigned as the P-3 Requirements Officer, where he organized and led multinational, multidiscipline teams from five countries and four major defense contractors that established the requirements for the initial design of the P-8A, the newest Navy aircraft. As commanding officer, Naval Activity Naples, he managed all security, flight operations, facility maintenance, support services, and environmental compliance for three separate installations and 14,000 U.S. and NATO military civilians and family members, along with 800 civilian personnel. He was selected to be the first deputy commander, Navy Region Europe, where he was responsible for the security of force protection and day-to-day -day operations of all U.S. Navy bases in Europe, encompassing 30,000 personnel. After retiring from the Navy, he was Vice President of Operations at Interactive Data Corporation, where he was responsible for operations management, strategy development, organizational alignment, communications, IT service management processes, business continuity, and disaster recovery across the globe. Brendan then became the president of Halo Maritime Defense Systems, a developer of the most advanced maritime security barrier systems in the world, which are now used by U.S. Navy in Norfolk, Virginia, Bahrain, as well as the Israeli Navy. He currently sits on several boards and advises startup companies in renewable energy on how to move from concept to testing, to validation, and finally to commercialization. Captain Gray, Redding is honored to have you joining us today. Kevin, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Father Rock, Senator Lewis, Representative Jones, Select Board Member McCarthy, Town Manager Fidel Maltese, members Reading Police and Fire Department, who keep us safe every day. 
Students from Reading Memorial High School who join us today, the Boy Scouts and the Cub Scouts, and fellow citizens of Reading, good morning. There are three days that we celebrate the military, specifically. Armed Forces Day, which is for those who are still in uniform. Veterans Day, which is for those who hung up their uniform. And Memorial Day, which is for those who never made it out of uniform. I won't go into the history of Memorial Day or Decoration Day, as that has already been covered. But since 2000, year 2000, Congress passed legislation asking all Americans to pause for a national moment of remembrance at 3 p.m. local time. Memorial Day honors the men and women who died for our freedom, and it's a reminder that we must honor them. They died for freedom. They died for the freedom for us to respect one another. They died for the freedom to listen to one another. The freedom to disagree without being disagreeable. Everyone who serves in the military, and especially those who died, follow a simple code. They live with honor, courage, and commitment. They have hopes and dreams. They choose to follow a path that is bigger than themselves, knowing that they may have to pay the ultimate sacrifice, but not believing that they will. If you have ever had the opportunity to visit a national cemetery such as Arlington, or for those of us who've had the privilege of visiting the National Cemetery in Normandy, it is very sobering and humbling seeing rows and rows of our fallen heroes. But what does Memorial Day mean to me personally? When I was growing up in Dorchester, Memorial Day to me was the start of summer. When I was the age of these wonderful young men and women from our high school and Boy Scouts and Cub Scouts, I was not participating in Memorial Day commemorations. And after high school, I went to the Naval Academy. Memorial Day was not personal to me then either, because at the Naval Academy, the first Wednesday in June, back then anyway, was when the seniors, or first class as they were called, graduated and went to the fleet and the rest of us moved up a class. Memorial Day 1974 was a very big deal for me because I was no longer a plebe. And after I graduated, I went to flight training. And Memorial Day was marked by, <clears throat> excuse me, barbecues on Pensacola Beach. In the spring of 1979, it was a normal weekend. We had a barbecue on Sunday afternoon Bunch of my classmates and I who were student aviators, and one of my classmates was all excited because the next day he was going to solo in the A-4 Skyhawk, a jet trainer. That Monday night, we were all notified that on takeoff or landing, and frankly I can't remember which, his aircraft crashed, and he was killed and was posthumously awarded his Navy wings. When Memorial Day rolled around, it now had some significance as I personally knew somebody who died in the line of duty. A year later, a friend and classmate of mine was flying an A3 Skyhawk, uh, sorry, Sky Warrior aircraft, and crash landed trying to land on the aircraft carrier. Memorial Day was no longer a day for hamburgers and hot dogs and nothing else. We all now started paying attention and taking the time to remember those who left us too early in our career. As my career progressed, I continued up the ranks in the Navy with more responsibilities and meeting more people and being more involved with operations. On March 21st, 1991, I was the operations officer in VP9 at Moffa Field in California. It was a beautiful day like today. And routine operations were going on off the southern coast of California as air crew trained at the height of the Cold War. At 4 a.m. on March 22nd, my phone rang to notify me that two P-3s had collided off the coast of Southern California. They were on a routine training mission. There were 14 air crew on one aircraft and 13 on the other, and I knew most of them. It was the single worst aviation accident in naval aviation history. 
I got the call because our squadron had what we call the ready alert. The ready alert squadron always had a crew on a hot standby ready to launch should the need arise. 30 minutes after that phone call, we launched a search and rescue mission. We flew search and rescue around the clock for three to four days. All we found was debris and an oil slick, but eventually the Navy found the remains scattered across the ocean floor. Now, people have asked me, did the Navy recover the remains for burial? The answer is no. Why? Well, the answer is simple. The Navy views the sea as an appropriate resting place for a sailor. That Memorial Day was especially hard on our close-knit aviation community. So the next time you're by the sea and you look out, think about the sailors there. They also deserve your respect. Now, I can't be totally Navy-centric, but Major Dave Douthit, U.S. Army, and I were stationed together in the Pentagon as interns for the Joint Chiefs of Staff when we were junior officers. I actually met Dave before I met my wife, Ann. Dave was in the first Iraq War, and he survived combat operations. After hostilities had ended, he was driving from one base to another when a huge sandstorm came up, which are known to happen in that part of the world, and the standard operating procedure was to stop where you are and let the stamp sandstorm pass because you are in zero visibility. Dave was in a Jeep and they did stop. And they waited. But a large truck did not follow standard operating procedures and plowed into the parked Jeep, the parked Jeep killing all occupancies. Then came 9-11, in particular the Pentagon. The Pentagon is the largest office building in the world. When the plane crashed into it that day, 125 people lost their lives. It's a miracle more were not killed, but I knew six of the people very well. One was Captain Jack Punches, who I had for a year tried to persuade to take orders to Naples, Italy. But he decided, no, he was going to retire instead so he did not have to pull his daughter out of high school. He said to me in our last conversation, I need to see her graduate. He did not get that opportunity. And Lieutenant Scott Lamana, one of my junior officers in my squadron, who I had worked to get him his orders to the Pentagon. They went to work that morning to an office building. They weren't going to combat. They weren't training for war per se, but that's what they've been trained to do. They just were going to work. So yes, Memorial Day is personal to me. With all these stories have in common is on Memorial Day we remember, and rightly so, the fallen heroes. The heroes who are shot and killed in combat. <clears throat> but there's a whole other group of heroes, which are the ones who die training to go to war, preparing for war, to go in harm's way. See, the military is a dangerous occupation. We don't think of it that way as we sit here at home. In the Navy, most of our casualties tend to be aviators, but not all. Divers drown, sailors get killed on ships, Air Force pilots crash while training, Marines die in training-related accidents all too often, and Coast Guardsmen die trying to save others in peril on the sea. Because you see, no matter what service you're in, you train like you fight and you fight like you train. You never leave anything on the table. As we think about these brave men and women who gave up their tomorrow so we can have our todays, I don't think anyone can remember their politics or how much money they had because it didn't matter. They were all Americans and all died for love of their country, and we cannot diminish that. We must honor that. And we must honor the Gold Star families who lent our nations their sons, daughters, spouses, mothers and fathers who never came home. So as you go home today, and hopefully have fun and have a barbecue and cook a hot dog or a hamburger, I ask you to set an alarm and at 3 o'clock have a moment of silence in support of the nationwide attempt to get every American, no matter where they are in the world, at 3 o'clock local time to remember those men and women who've given up so much. The other thing I ask you to do is that when you run into a World War II veteran otherwise known as the greatest generation, 
and they earned that title, or a Korean War vet, or a Vietnam vet, or an Iraqi or Afghanistan War vet, or a Cold Warrior, please thank them for their service. They will appreciate it, and you will be better off for making the effort. In this time of need in our country, we are getting to the point where we sometimes don't listen to each other, or we try, but we don't succeed. Remember, if we refuse to listen to other to each other, we do not honor these brave men and women who died, so we have the right of freedom of speech and freedom of expression. Please, honor them. There is another group of vet veterans who make it home, but with invisible scars. They need our support and prayers. Many of them make the ultimate sacrifice after coming home. You see, they are still in combat. Right now, veterans have a suicide rate 52% higher than non-veterans. We need to try and help these veterans who are in pain. And since we have kind of a Navy entourage up here with Father Rock, he and I had served in the Navy together, and with Kevin, I have to call out a famous John F. Kennedy quote. On August 1st, 1963, at the United States Naval Academy, he said, and I quote, I can imagine no more rewarding, rewarding career in any man who may be asked in this century what he did to make his life worthwhile. I think and respond with a good deal of pride and satisfaction, I served in the United States Navy, unquote. Now, I would like to add my own personal modification to that for anyone who serves and not just the military, but all our first responders, when asked that question, they can proudly say, I can take pride and, and satisfaction in that I served my country. And finally, this is Kevin Bo Miller's last Memorial Day ceremony working for the town of Reading. Kevin, you have been an inspiration to all our vets and have helped so many. You will be sorely missed, sir. I wish you luck as you sail into your new f future. May you have fair winds and following seas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brendan. The Reading Memorial High School Band will now perform the Battle Hymn of the Republic which will be followed by taps.
That concludes our services here at Laurel Hill Cemetery. Again, thank you to all of you for attending. I'd like to take this time to thank all those who participated in today's services. To the band and director Joe Mulligan, great job as always. Thank you to the amazing Cemetery Grounds crew who teamed up with the Parks Department and once again did a tremendous job preparing our 52 acres of cemeteries. Your pride in your work is noted. Thank you to Raymond Boyd, Vietnam War veteran, our soldier and sailor's graves officer, and his small army of volunteers that carried out General Logan's orders and decorated over 2,300 veterans' graves in town. Also, a special thank you to John Myers and Troop 702, who was the Troop, Troop 702 Scoutmaster, for his dedication and leadership over the years. Without him, his fellow leaders, and all the scouts, events like this would not happen. Again, thank you to all the scouts, all the volunteers, and people that showed, out on, showed up on Saturday morning to place all the flags and flowers in record time. Well done, thank you. Another special thank you to Bill Brown, who has been my right-hand man for the past seven years. He has a true heart of gold and has given so much back to Reading, especially our veterans and families. Thank you, Bill. Thank you to the Reading Select Board, Town Manager Fidel Maltez, and Assistant Town Manager Gene Delios for their support of veterans throughout the year. May God bless all those who have gone before us and all those currently serving to protect our freedom. Ceremonies will continue at Forest Glen Cemetery at 1045, Charles Lawn Cemetery at 1130, and Woodhead Cemetery at 12 noon. Have a wonderful day, and again, thank you for being here with us this morning.